Perfect. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Today, as we gather here again in the last Thursday of this year, 2021, for our Think Tank webinar series again, I'm reminded of a few lines of Emily Dickinson. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. These few lines sum up our lives in 2021. It has been an year of low, ups, sorrows, happiness, miseries, but to sum it all, however, we can say that we all have shown strength, resilience, hope, and we do have hope for the coming year. Today, as we gather from the last webinar series of this year, as I said, I'd like to give a brief introduction or reminder again that this webinar series has been initiated by Indian Institute of Material Management and Nirvan University, Jaipur. Indian Institute of Material Management is a professional organization which has professionals from logistic management, supply management, and material management, has more than 10,000 members and branches all over India. Nirvan University, Jaipur is situated in Pink City of Jaipur and offers interdisciplinary courses in all the streams and has been functioning under the new education policy. It ranges, the courses ranges from UG, PG, diploma and PhD programs and encompassing all the streams like engineering, agriculture, education, and also Center for Women and Gender Studies. So I, Professor Tanu Tandon, Dean, School of Education and Director, Center for Women and Gender Studies, I welcome everyone, our esteemed speaker, the audience, the scholars who are attached to us through Facebook. And I would also like to welcome Dr. Amit Mehrotra to this webinar on behalf of Professor Ravi Goyal, Pro-President Pro and Registrar Nirvan University, Jaipur, who has been the motivating force and the, this webinar is a brainchild of him himself. So, Professor Merotra, it gives me pleasure to invite you to the webinar. For our audience, I would like to give a brief introduction about Professor Merotra. Professor Merotra, Amit Merotra is a hospitality and tourism industry wizard. He has been in this industry for more than 12 years. He's widely traveled and has presented numerous papers and conferences in the areas of his expertise, which include hospitality education, assessment, technology in higher education, Native American cuisine and tourism, and he's an Indian by heart and has all the Indian things fixed right there in the heart, which I can speak of. He's also a member of International Council on Hotel, Restaurant, and Institutional Education. He has served in ACPHA, that is, Accreditation Commission of Program in Hospitality Administration as team member and chair conducting site visits to institutions across United States. Currently, he is functioning as assistant professor in Department of Hospitality Management, New York City College of Technology, City University of New York. And it is a matter of pride for us that he accepted our invitation to be a speaker in the webinar. And it's so late for him at night, but still he was generous and kind enough to spare his sleep time with us and share his wisdom and experience and also speak on the topic about opportunities and challenges in the hospitality industry post pandemic. Professor Merotra, I welcome you to the webinar. And now the dais is yours. Thank you, Dr. Tandon. I am delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It may be late, but you know, as most of you should know, it's a holiday time in the United States. So, you know, it's a little break that we get before we go back. And, you know, it's an interesting time that we're having this session because we, you know, the title that we were discussing, right? When we were discussing the webinar, we talked about pandemic and post pandemic, but as we all know, there is a 
unfortunate situation that's unfolding around the world, especially with a new variant. And uh, currently, as I sit here, uh, we're having, and I could be wrong a little bit on the numbers, but almost 300,000 cases a day. A couple of days ago, they were, I think, half a million. So it's a very un unusual time for the industry. But I'll be happy to, um, you know, give some insight. And I've been speaking on this topic a lot in the last 24 months. So, you know, whenever it started, that was almost almost 22 months, I think, right? We're losing a track of time here. So, so <clears throat> yes, so it's been a difficult time for hospitality industry. And especially because now people are losing their, you know, patients. And um, it is also leading to staffing shortages um, across service sector, uh, in particular hospitality and tourism, because people, you know, are falling sick and they're supposed to quarantine as per, you know, the requirement, or they're supposed to isolate, and it's having a domino effect. If you, if you read in the last few days, there were thousands of flights canceled around the world, and that's impacting, you know, a significant portion of travel, especially during this holiday season around the world as people travel. And in the United States, of course, people were stuck. And I'm sure if you read, um, even in Asia, there were a lot of flights being canceled. So it's an, it's an interesting time. It's an unfortunate time, but I'm sure like the early alliance that you said, uh, I think they were very promising. And I think, um, yes, hope is what we all stand for, right? And I think there's a lot of hope, but there are a lot of opportunities that have come out of this pandemic and we must acknowledge them. I think we have to acknowledge them and we have to learn from them and we have to make sure that we use those opportunities. Otherwise, you know, we'll be only ourselves to blame for that. So, um, so I, wanted to, I wanted to keep this interactive. So I have a couple of slides I wanna share, but uh, anytime if you feel that you want to have a question that relates to a certain slide or anything, feel free to ask. And if there is a question on Facebook Live, I'll be happy to answer. I've also tried to make it as simple as possible for anybody who may not be from hospitality and tourism. But I think there are two things I tell my students. We all love food, right? I do. Okay. And we all love travel. At least we think about travel if you're not able to do it, right? And those two things, how can you go wrong with that? Yeah. And, you know, but you, you know, it, it, that's the interesting part. So let me share the PowerPoint and, um, okay. I guess everybody can see it, right? Yes, yes, please go. On. Okay, great. So um, I wanna just give a, like a brief overview according to the World Tourism Organization, which is the UN body. And, you know, a lot of data that you're gonna see today um, because we're still sort of gathering information from 2020 and 2021, um, you know, a lot of it is from pre-pandemic but it does give us a context. So if you look at it, and I'm not gonna be boring and read word by word, but I'm gonna say that tourism, which is a mother industry, I always call it a mother industry. And why is that? Because hotels function and restaurants function and you know any kind of event functions because people are traveling. Whether you're even traveling from one city, whether you're in Jaipur and you're going to Udaipur for something, or you're gonna to go to New Delhi for a business meeting, that is tourism, it's inbound tourism, but it's tourism, right? So it is a very important industry around the world, whether it's domestic or whether it's international. Also for some countries, tourism is like the most important industry. You know, it says, the UN says sometimes it is as important as 20% of the GDP. And you'll see later on in the slides, some of the countries, I mean, they're suffering. Uh, but Thailand, another example, hugely important to them and I can only, and my heart goes out to the hospitality and tourism workers there because it's not going to be easy. It has not been easy. And also it has suffered the most because we are, you know, human beings are social animals. So we like to interact. And COVID did one thing to us, take away that very important piece from us, right? <clears throat> and that was, that was it. Now, how do you interact and how do you do anything? So I just want to quickly share a couple of slides globally, what has happened. And this happened right um, in 2019 to 2020. So if you see tourism and travel revenue, so you see it um, in 2019, 
you see the original forecast, and I'm not going to read the numbers, but you see the drop in, in 2020 alone. Now, there was a lot of, you know, things written about that all this is going to come back in 2021, and we were hoping, and it did, domestically, and I will, I will talk about this a little bit later when it comes to India. There's a there's a piece that came out in one of the newspapers there, but domestically may have improved country to country, region to region, but internationally, globally, uh, it never came back to 2019. And it's suffering because of the new restrictions and the new, you know, I would say laws that are not consistent. Some countries want you to have two tests. Some country wants you to have one test before coming. Some country doesn't want you to have a test. Somebody wants to, some other kind of test. So hospitality and tourism has such, you know, inconsistencies right now around the world. When you take the world as a whole, that is, it is impacting. And I think it's time that everybody in the industry globally comes together and says, we want to have one standard. And that standard will help everybody, everyone. And what is that standard? Well, that's for the experts and, you know, um, not in the industry itself, but also the medical experts to decide. Okay, so I'm going to show you three different continents. Asia is included. So you have North America. I was able to get this from the Statista, which uh, you know has a lot of data on what's going on um, in different industries. So in North America, you see the drop. In you know Europe, you see the drop. In you know in um, South America, sorry, in Asia, you see the drop. And I want to share with you the countries that are really, really making a lot of money to tourism. And you see France being number one. We all know it's the most visited country. And you see that almost 90 million tourists. And then you have Spain and you have United States, almost the third in the category. But look at China. That also is getting a lot of tourists. Turkey, uh, you have Mexico, you have Thailand. Now, compared to their own populations, the amount of tourism they're getting, I mean, really makes a huge, huge impact on what is going on. So when COVID happened, um, not only this got, got, got shut down, but also the lodging industry got shut down. You know, the restaurants got shut down, events got shut down, big conferences got shut down. So it, 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 was, um, it was a last, you know, like a, like a nail in the coffin when one after another, like domino effect, everything started to shut down. Anyway, moving on, this is just a little, you know, snapshot of hotel occupancy, which basically translates into how much of the hotel rooms are occupied in a given day. Um, and if you can see during the pandemic, it was just uh, a bloodbath, right? It was really, really bad. And this is something I wanted to share with you. Now, this is from last year. Now, if you think it has improved, I will show you something else. Um, so this is a little headline from Times of India, and it came out last year in the heat of the pandemic. And it says that 14.5 million jobs, and Times of India is a major newspaper in the country. So they talked about, you know, how many millions of people have lost their jobs. Now imagine these are, this is a number, but these are people. And these people go back to their, you know, to feed their families. And these people have, you know, children or people or loved ones to take care of. So it is, it is also an industry which suddenly shut down. Uh, some people were laid off. Some people were put on the bench. Uh, some people are getting a quarter of the salary. I think we all know different examples of that. We probably have people that we know who were in this industry that was suffering. Um, so that was really unfortunate. But this is just one isolated case in India. No, this is across the world. Um, this happened, you know, I can share a small example with you. I live in Manhattan, in, which is one of the boroughs of New York. And last year, a lot of restaurants were shutting down. A lot of hotels were shutting down. And the hope was, like Dr. Tandon said, the hope was that everything will open up. And yes, a lot of things opened up and people started to go back to restaurants. But recently with the Omicron surge, a lot of restaurants are not having customers or some are having it, but not enough. So I'm going to talk about some of the opportunities later, what we can do as the industry. But um it's unfortunate because if another variant comes, who knows, um, we keep reading about one, we keep like not coming, but we keep reading that the possibility is very real. But if this keeps happening, um, the restaurants can only take so much, the hotels can only take so much because especially for lodging industry, it, it's, it's a lot of investment. So, and, and if people don't travel, if people don't interact, 
um, that is going to be difficult. So how do we make it safe and how do we really make it happen? So I wanted to bring out uh, an example. Um, Dr. Tandon, are there any questions in the meantime? Because I don't want to keep going on and um, I could take a no, question I, or anything related. I, I, I think Professor Mehta, you please continue. We'll take the questions later maybe when we have- Okay, great. Questions. Okay, great, great. So this is a, 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 you know, a piece that came out today in the Hindustan Times. And it is talking about a country of 1.4 billion almost, uh, the country of my birth actually. Um, and it's saying that a lot of Indians are now doing inbound tourism because they're not allowed to travel and there are a lot of restrictions, but this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity because this is where the domestic hospitality and tourism market can pivot and say that let's focus on the domestic traveler because let's be real. A lot of time, a lot of lodging and restaurant brands were you know, always focusing on the, on the international traveler because they were also more um, monetarily making more sense because they were bringing a, a larger fat you know, paycheck to them. Um, and also more income. But I think um, the way we're seeing domestic market in India is equally more important because people want to travel. People are sick of staying home. People are wanting to explore. And if you have the right package and the right way to market your own destination. And one thing, which I did not put in here because I don't want people to get scared, there is an article about the state of Rajasthan. And it's about Omicron. And it's about the variant. And I think it came, I, I, can, I can type it up later in the chat uh, in one of the other newspapers. And they talk about the Rajasthan fears that international travel is not you know, coming back for the short term. And Rajasthan receives a lot of international tours. And what are they going to do? And what should they do? Because you know, it's an important industry for that state, uh, rightfully so. It's a beautiful state, has a lot of beautiful places to visit. Um, I have always enjoyed it. So the thing is, well, this could be an opportunity. You, you, know, you go to the domestic uh, traveler and you have conferences, you open up more events within the country because is it gonna be safer to do events within the country? Well, yes, because you're not having the, not the threat, the fear of like international travelers and bringing a variant, we don't know. The variants could, be, could come in from within the country itself, but you, know, you could have, policies in place, you know, safety practices in place, and you have a market that's ready. Um, and then you can use that. So that's one thing. So I want to talk about um, uh, just the US just for a second. And I want to talk about some of the, you know, key performance indicators, like, you know, this is, you know, in, in, in America, the occupancy was suffering. And if you can see that, which is hotel occupancy. You can see the percentage of drops in, in hotel room nights, which is each night is one hotel room night. So millions of nights were lost. And these hotels cost millions and millions of dollars to create. And they also have to pay their rent because sometimes they are paying mortgage. So a lot of hotels, especially as I said, I live in Midtown uh, Manhattan, um, a lot of major hotels and Midtown Manhattan is where Times Square is. So you have a lot of hotels and a lot of the hotels didn't survive um, and they had to shut down. So um, it, is an, it was an unfortunate time. It's still unfortunate because we're still finding, a, you know, not the best scenario to come back to pre-2019 level. And that's going to take some time. So what can industry do? That's where I talk about the opportunity. Well, first of all, you have to look for new alternative revenue streams, as I showed domestic market. You could also do, uh, you know, restaurants could do is more takeout. And I think we all know um, in, in, in India and around the world, uh, takeout delivery for food really increased, uh, even grocery delivery increased. And a lot of companies popped up out of nowhere doing the service. So that was another revenue stream. Hotels uh, were using their rooms as offices. Um, you know, they were moving away from events or large gatherings and doing something else. And now with hotels, especially in India, not expecting too many international travelers, I'm sure they'll 
there will there are going to be some that'll trickle in, but you know the levels to expect that was in 2019. Um, we're going to fool ourselves if we are going to say that it's going to happen right in the next six months. It may not happen for a foreseeable future, maybe a year, two years. And that, you know, and nobody's going to sit and wait because everybody has bills to pay. Everybody has, you know, wants food to eat. So hotels and restaurants will have to come up with new strategies to build um, a new set of revenue streams. The next is safety. You have to make sure that anything that you do, you keep communicating about safety. And that's where the third part is, which is communication. Communication, communication, communication. Keep telling everybody, whoever's your customer, that there is, there is a very safe, this is a very safe environment. We take this seriously. And a lot of hotels, I recently did visit India and I saw they were taking great care in making sure that um, the place was safe and COVID protocols were followed in the hotels and lobby, et cetera. Uh, communication, of course, is the key and technology. It's changing everything. Uh, you know, the QR codes appearing, um, you know, you can check in on through your phone, you can download an app, you can choose your phone. You don't even have to see the front desk agent. Unfortunate because somebody's going to lose their job or there'll be less front desk agent, um, but technology is going to be here and it's going to be stronger. So what are some of the uh, strategies for new revenue streams? So um, you can find, you know, um, any kind of cultural thing. You can find social or local things that you can target. Um, you can find uh, your space can be important. You can rent it out. You can, you know, hotels in the United States, some restaurants, they were renting kitchens out as a way to make money because somebody else, you know, some home business might need a kitchen to use. And, you know, the best case scenario is that we may not have the pre-pandemic level for months to come. Um, so that is, and that's something that we should, we should basically, even if taking this with a grain of salt, we should be sort of be honest about it, that this is how it's going to be. Safety, uh, make sure that people feel safe, they feel secure. Um, also, um, you know, there are a lot of different brands that all have their standards, uh, but any brand, big or small, can put processes in place that are reminding the customer that everything is safe. You know, even when you go to some places in, in India, I saw, when you go to a small little shop, uh, the people that were more concerned about, you know, their customers, they would have, everybody will have a mask on, they'll have gloves on, they'll have sanitizer bottle. And these were very small little kiosks, but they, you know, and that was a good selling point. You know, I, I know that I was going with somebody and, you know, I wanted to eat local food and I said, oh, this place looks much cleaner and nicer and they're using the protocol. That's a big impact. It doesn't take much to do that, but it does have a deeper impact. So it's psychology, you know, uh, so that's important. Um, so what you're going to see in safety is that you're going to have contactless service. So you're going to have check-in and check-outs in a hotel. I don't want to sound too technical here, but you will also have minimum people moving around, which you already see that the staff in restaurants and hotels, at least in the United States and some of the places that I've traveled briefly during the pandemic, um, they're very particular about how many people are let on the, on the floor, even housekeeping services are not every day. If somebody doesn't want housekeeping service, uh, they can forego it. They can say, we don't, we don't need it. Um, the sanitizing stations, um, that, make, that make an impact. And you will see a lot of digital and digitization into what we do in hospitality industry. You're going to see every company using an app. You know, Hilton uh, was working on and they launched an app where you can use a phone and you can use the app and you can open any hotel room from there. I think, yes, and they spent millions of dollars on it and they felt that it was really safe. And you're going to see more such things coming into almost all the brands because the less contact you have, people just might feel safer. And in, I don't know how the cycle is in India, but, um, but in the United States, this is also a flu season. So people are even more apprehensive, not only a new variant, but also a flu season. So the minimum contact they have with people and anything that people have touched 
the more secure they feel. It's just human, you know, mind. Um, also, you know, you can manage um, all the customer contact remotely. Um, that might help. <clears throat> that was just a little, um, you know, short, you know, little thing I wanted to say, because I know you have some questions that you had thought about um, that you wanted to ask, but, you know, I can go on and on. I didn't want to make it too technical, but I just want to say one uh, bottom line is that um, the, the unfortunate thing about this is that we are human beings and hospitality industry is all about human interaction, but there's something else. You can still make service with a smile and with a, some kind of a, you know, uh, interaction without too much human element in it. I mean, too much personal interaction. You can, you can give them a call. You can send them a text message, a very sweet text message. You know, I'm glad that you've checked in. You know, you can, the wait staff in some of the restaurants, they will come in, they will smile and you can see the eyes through the mask and they will, you know, they will give you the QR code and they will say, you can order and place the order. I will come and bring and deliver your food. You know, gone are the days and waiter will come and actually take your order. So many places in, 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 um, in New York are, are using that. So you still like the restaurant, you still like the, the very, you know, the service culture of the restaurant, but they have modified it. So, and I think it's going to stay as long as, because this pandemic is gonna become a, you know, an endemic, yes. So it's not going away, we know that. So I think we should be honest about this. So at that, I'm gonna, you know, let you ask questions that you had, so. Uh, that was a very elaborate one and uh, what you presented was very useful and even for a layman who is not from hospitality industry, then also you understand how you do it. Like I have two examples from here, from where I am sitting in Lucknow. Uh, I yeah. have a very good friend who has his restaurant pack and chew in Lucknow, Nitin. Mm -hmm. And uh, during the pandemic, at the peak of it, after the lockdown finished in a April, May and we started opening, he came up uh, Obviously, the food delivery was not there. The restaurant business was not there. And uh, although he's very good and it's very neat, clean, very good, a very good restaurant at Gomti Nagar in Lucknow, where we are. So he started delivering sanitized vegetables and fruits. Okay. Home delivery. So it was like, uh, it was like for people like me and many other, it was so welcome change because we were delighted and we were like, oh, thanks a lot, Nitin. You have done this, and then he came up with his app. Now he is delivering sanitized vegetables, fruits, cheese, frozen things, whatever, because he had access to the organic farms and people who are, you know, from where he was mm -hmm. buying all those things for his restaurant. And then slowly and mm -hmm. gradually, the food delivery also picked up. He opened his restaurant. Now, again, I don't know how the things would be. But mm -hmm. then, when I was talking to him, because a good friend, I was talking to him, he said, Tanu, I've employed five people more i haven't i haven't shown the doors to my already uh, the people who are working because i've going to his restaurant for past like since 2008 or 9 and i've seen the same people working so he said it's my family i cannot tell them to leave but when we started Very home delivering all these uh, fruits and vegetables and um, uh, you know freshly baked cakes and cheese and whatever whatever is there mm -hmm. i had to hire more people he now he is giving the um, uh, facilities of sending chopped vegetables, peeled garlic, and there are peepees, chopped fruits and everything. So if you want a pomegranate, it's all, you know, deseeded and everything. So this was the opportunity like you talked about that people are you know, coming up, coming up mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. And um, like there are so many home cooks which have come up. I know yeah, many of my yeah. friends who have started making, like I received a lot of things, asking my mom to make those achars which we make at home, the typical oil-less achars which are marketed as which we make at home and everyone has their own recipe. Mm -hmm. So, but there was like, oh, why don't you sell this? And obviously I, I, I'm not that I'm being an academician, but I've seen many people coming up with those things. And one of my friends, uh, like a contents, has started with this, home cook meals kind of thing where and then yeah. there were many people who started doing this charity thing also wherein they send the food parcels to the people who are affected with covid and nobody to look after them or to make them and give them a nutritious meal like i was reading somewhere in gurgaon 
or somewhere where the offices were there and the restaurants and everything shut down but the ladies mm-hmm. they have started sending the food to all the people who were there and who were unable to cook or whatever may be the reason so as you said that there are things which uh, have been down but that has also given a rise to the opportunities and mm-hmm. new ways of looking at things but still yes there is a gloom in the industry it has suffered a lot and uh, i don't know how to, uh, we have been reading that omicron is not so uh, infectious or viral and but still having said that a large number of pe- numbers means some or other have to, like the things are serious so i just wanted to know your take away in few lines although you have elaborated it still how in few lines you can uh, sum up that it has impacted the hospitality and tourism industry few lines just a summary of that which you have done okay thank you so one of the major impacts of covid has been a lot of businesses have closed um some have reopened um also a lot of people that were in the industry they were laid off around the world um now i could slightly segue from here and say some of those people you know went to industries that or found a new opportunity great but a significant majority that loved being in hospitality that you know loved they never saw this coming you know they never saw that the industry they love so much they love being in a restaurant people are somewhat questioning is it a safe industry to be in in terms of you know keeping your doors open all the time keeping your business open all the time you know uh, the chefs you know who are like oh some passion to cook and now they're like you know i didn't want to be an engineer i didn't want to be a doctor all i love is food all i love is you know and i have um professional um colleagues and friends who run travel companies and students and they all they did all their life was taking people to these incredible amazing journeys around the world and they are like what am i going to do every day the rules change and so bottom line like to sum it up it's a very it's a very unusual time because as i said the laws in are not consistent around the world and i'm talking it as a global industry so if you want to go from country a to country b you have to read something else the people are losing their mind they're like for example an indian wants to go to thailand now they have to read up on what thailand wants but they have to go to now singapore they have to read about what singapore wants by the time they read up on that they start acting on it singapore changes its you know you know entry requirements now they have a conference an executive in india say in mumbai wants to go to a conference in australia australia had this law or this kind of you know entry point uh, requirements and now they change it so it's it's difficult and so many people so many travel experts have said that we want a consistent approach and i think the consistent approach is missing and it has been missing even in the pandemic time how to deal with the pandemic globally but so that impact has been phenomenal and it's coming back a little bit airlines are coming back back they're filling up a little bit but a lot of it uh, significantly is lost you know it's not 2019 we're not there yet we were thinking 2021 was going to be better i would say maybe a tad bit better 2022 now we have omicron hanging up there in america we already facing it you we all know what is happening in europe they're having lockdowns they're having night curfews um it's only going to make things more complicated i'm not saying those are not needed or what countries are doing are, are are wrong what i'm saying is that because there's so much happening during the time how do you think about and leisure activity like going to a restaurant or going to travel because remember hospitality and tourism is a leisure industry you know it is not a medical care where you are say diabetic and i have to go to the hospital it's like i do want to travel to say cambodia but you know you'd also say okay this is not the time so you'll you know or you know and that is why i think a lot of countries are focusing on their domestic market you know uh, you saw that in europe a lot of europeans were traveling within the continent uh, in america i'll give you an example last year the american national parks you know like you have national parks around in india the american national parks were flooded because everybody wanted to go to a national park because they couldn't go much international so people were seeing and reseeing their country itself so it benefited you know domestic tourism but 
if the country is depending on international visitors, they are having a difficult time. You know, whether it's France or Spain or Thailand or even India, because India was seeing a huge rise in international visitors and now it's almost dried up, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. and Rajasthan in particular, you know, yeah. it's, it's so interesting we're talking about it. And Rajasthan is one of the most, I would say, states in the forefront of attracting, you know, international traveler. I can only imagine the hospitality industry is like waiting and impatient. When is this thing going to end? You know, and for an international travel to come to Rajasthan, yes, they, they can have a dream, but for them to come there, it's taking a lot of, you know, um, a little bit of risk and a lot of, in, you know, mind kind of a thing, makeup that, okay, I need to go and I should go. Not everybody is that strong, strong hearted, you know, so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But I've seen people going to in, in-house, yes, inbound travel, it has increased. A lot yeah. of people have been going to Ladakh, I've saw many people. Um, uh, in fact, there was a trend which I've seen maybe with the other places also. A lot of my people, of my cousins or my friends, I've saw, seen they went to they go, went to those uh, stay homes and they started working from there. So they oh yes, that that industry months. did really well. Yes. Yes. So you know they were in Bangalore. They did their apartment in Bangalore. They decided to go to Manali and there was a quaint stay at home. Uh, no, the place and they rented for four to five months and they stayed there worked and they were very happy with it but that was the initial part of it when you were liking the quietness and work from home ka leisure but now it is like getting on your nerves because for how long can you sit here and do so i have two things in my mind when i ask you this question dr Mirotra. Uh, a that we are talking about that now we have enough of it now we want to go out and uh, meet people whether it's bubble or not or enough of bubble also because how long can you have this bubble also because somewhere it's going Second, I've seen a lot of uh, small restaurants or cafes which have mushroomed here and there. And then we have also a lot of dhabas and small places, at least in India, when we talk about. I'm sure some street food vendors, but they are abroad also there. there. So in keeping in view of all these two things, how long do you think this impact will last? I know it's a very hypothetical question, especially with Omicron and variant, which I am very hopeful that by March, everything would be okay, being a very positive and a hopeful person but then again we don't we cannot be like you know so it's like a very hypothetical question but still i would like to cheer your things how long will you think this impact will last so it's so as in as a hospitality and tourism professional i would make some points but i'm not a medical expert but i am i've been seeing what you know i've been reading almost every day every hour is one thing that can stop this or is that a couple of things are happening. People are becoming more used to the situation now than before. They kind of know this is going to exist. It's not going away. But I think the more vaccination we have, you know, the more vaccination and people eventually will get boosters. Some of the people that are more immunocompromised will get boosters. There is gonna be less chance and fear of hospitalization. And I think that is going to spur. So you're already seeing people are stepping out and we have a lot of food trucks when you talk about street, uh, street food. We have a city called Portland. It's in the state of Oregon. It's known for its food truck industry. And, but New York City is alone. We have lots of food trucks and New York City is considered like gold mine. You know, you can get food from any country in the world, you name it. So people love their food. New Yorkers love food and we love to go out and eat and people are doing that. Yes, sometimes there is a fear, uh, you know, restaurants the last couple of days and weeks, I was walking two days ago, and I saw one of the very important restaurants was sort of like empty. It, it was never like that. And I think because people fear. So when is it going to end? I think, <clears throat> I think hopefully by March, if Omicron or, you know, people realize it's not very, um, it can, it's infectious, but it's not super, you know, um, yeah, super crazy when it comes to hospitalization. I think that might be a positive sign, but also let's not fool ourselves because the scientific community is saying that there could be future variants coming in. You know, we've been watching that on TV and reading about that. Now that is, we don't know, it's an unknown, it's hypothetical. But for the most part, vaccination, making sure that you will not go to the hospital, I think it's going to bring people at ease. And people will begin to do, you know, you can't put human in a jail. It's not going to happen. They're not going to be at home. 
they will like to, you know, eventually venture out, right? That's just the human spirit. You know, you, you know, so people will go out, you know, and people want to meet their loved ones. People want to go and travel. There are, in India is a, is a very young country. You know, a majority of India's population is, is, you know, under 30 or 25 or whatever. And you are going to tell these people not to live their dream. Um, you know, and, you know, and I think it's difficult. It, it, it can be sold. Yes. You know, be careful, be safe. But if you tell them just lock yourself up in your apartment and don't travel or don't go to restaurants, that's not going to happen. Um, how long? You know, how for long? how long? Exactly. So, so there's an opportunity there. And your friend did really good. I think actually so many examples of those kind of examples I've been hearing from my students itself who started, you know, entrepreneurship uh, ventures in you know setting up small kitchens and cooking in there and sending food and making money off that so many people did that it's a great thing you know human you know spirit as yes. i say isn't it resilience resilience yeah yes, yes. that's what Absolutely. we are looking at uh, like uh, being a psychology person and talking to my psychologist mm -hmm. friends and as a counselor and other places i've seen that now that uh, what you said is right now what we are trying to do is we have been trying to do is but now we are trying to find the midway out and if you have vaccines and then the medicines which have just come Merck and Pfizer's pills are, and less of hospitalization uh, I can hope against the hope that by March or April we might be you know, find a solution to it because we have to because there is no way out we have to we have to find this, a way yeah out. this is going to be the third year so Yes, you know, and even with the elderly populations or the children who are now vaccinated and now used to of wearing the mask, mm -hmm. even thought, I see two, three-year-olds also somehow managing with their mask and everything because they also know. But uh, it has a psychological, so, a psychosocial impact also, which I know is like, this, uh, like the preschoolers are very afraid to go near the students. Like I was talking to a student who has just opened a preschool and I was talking to her and how has been the reaction and the response. My students are working there because I'm from education. They said, ma'am, when they are sitting alone in their rooms, they're very happy playing with their blocks. But the moment we try to bring four to five of them in one room, they get scared. They start, you know, you know, they, they start pulling, pushing up. And, because and they're not interacting much with people. They're not comfortable. They don't know how to do it. And even on a personal level, if I tell you, if I go to market or something, and I see many people, it's like, I, I, I get jittery. I said, oh, God, why, yeah. why, there are some, why there are so many people? Why don't they just stand apart? Why they are coming near to me? So I don't like those people coming to me and talking to me. So this is something. So there's a reason. There's a next question is all about that. And what are some of the profound changes which you feel or uh, that will be there for to stay in the hospitality industry and tourism industry? Some of you, you did mention about uh, the technology interventions and other things. So, so I think I'm going to reiterate on that again. I think technology, technology, technology. It is going to be a, a watershed moment for hospitality and tourism industry where you are going to see so much technology being, you know, some of the hospitality and uh, tourism industries were a little slow to adapt technology. You know, we are not, they're not Amazon or they're not like other things, you know, they want human to human interaction, right? But they have realized that technology can bypass a lot of things and make the comfort of doing things easier. So you are going to see digital check-ins at airports, you're going to see hotels where you can pre-check in. Those things are not going away. Now that is going to have a little bit of negative impact because less people will be hired. Now in a country like India where labor is relatively cheaper, um, you know, countries will, you know, companies will still invest in technology. You may have more servers, you may have more, you know, front desk agents, but it's not going to be like before you are still going to see less people being paid, which is unfortunate. So that's number one. The second is people are re-looking at what their, uh, what the industry stands for. I'm talking about people that own the restaurants and what's the, and, and, and people that are in the travel field because people like general population is, you know, people got a lot of time to think about life. So some people are, 
you know, want to travel more. So you may have, a lot of people are writing about this actually, that you may have a travel surge in 2022, 2023, because now here you're sitting and you're thinking, you know, I really want to see the world. Who knows what happens five years from now? I actually gave a small interview to one of the papers here. I said the same thing that, you know, there will be a surge, but let's not hope, let's not say that it's going to happen right now, but it's going to happen later. But there is a lot of optimism. So those are the couple of things that are going to profoundly change technology. Definitely. Um, you will see a lot of uh, older hospitality professionals retire or leave the industry. That's also something we're seeing. And this is, I I don't have a statistics to prove it, but I've been talking to a lot of industry professionals and um, some of the people that are in their mid forties or like late thirties or fifties, they're seeing a lot of their bosses just leave because, you know, they're like, you know, I'm done. I want to do something else because, you know, they're just like, they're over this two years, literally killed them in, mentally. Right. So that now will bring opportunity to the younger hospitality professionals. If anybody's listening, I always keep telling my students, if you're in your 20s and you aspire to be a hospitality professional, you're going to see a lot of people gone. And you have a lot of positions that are going to be open. It's hard to fill some positions in the United States at this, as I speak, because a lot of places, they're giving bonuses. Restaurants are giving bonuses. You know, hotels are giving bonuses to hire because they don't have enough workers. So in spite of technology coming in, you know, you still need staff. So, but I can go on and on. This is very, this is a great question. So, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I can understand that. There are certain questions which you make you reflect and think, and then you can think and think and talk about it. Uh, you rightfully said that there are opportunities which are going to come, which is going to be my next question. But I was thinking in 2K came, 2000, year 2000 came. Or before mm -hmm. that, when we heard of uh, computers and technology taking over. And in India, at least we had at that time of time, if you remember, 1989, 2000 or something. There was a big ho -ha -la about it that there are a lot of jobs will be gone and they will not. But then it didn't happen. A lot of new opportunities came up. And like when we were going up with the computers or something, it was something that, okay, okay, now what will happen? Now everyone has to go to an NIT and do it. And those were the times. And we were quite like the older people or the middle-aged ones were like, how will I be go? We'll be replaced by a computer. Yeah. Will not be required. But somehow we found a midway. Where yeah, absolutely. absolutely. We merged the technology of the computers and also the jobs. So in the same line, the, my next and the last question, which goes to it, that how do you envision the industry and some of the opportunities that might come out of this pandemic in coming years. Yes, so there will be a correction in the industry to of some sort. Um, what I mean by this is that um, if there is there are certain kind of restaurants um, that weren't doing well to begin with, and now they're going to have even lesser customers, maybe they weren't good to begin with, or they weren't really going after the demographic. Those are the kind of places that probably wouldn't survive. Some good ones, but also won't survive. Very unfortunate. Um, lodging brands or hospitality brands, uh, for hotels, I think they are going to, um, you know, reinvent themselves. Uh, they are going to add more technology. They're going to make it more seamless, the experience. As you said earlier, the human element is not going away. You know, that human touch is going to stay. And for travel industry, how is this going to shape up? Well, travel industry is going to see a momentous surge coming in the few years from now. And already, if you just, you know, I, I have a habit of like, you know, subscribing to different, you know, lodging and travel and food publications, but also headlines. And if you see, there's there so many airlines that are about to start business in 2022, 2023, and primarily because, yes, they want to start a business, but primarily because they expect a surge coming in in a few years, which is going to fill their pockets or you know help their shareholders or help their bottom line. So that is going to happen, but, you know, we have to be patient. It's not going to happen today. It's not going to happen tomorrow. This has been a very unusual event as we read on, we read and we watched on TV. This is a, a pandemic that is happening after hundred years because the last one was 1918. 
So, um, yeah. So, you know. The good part so is that it went away after two years. So now we have figured out. Yeah, I, I think it kept going and coming back in, in like waves. But those days, remember, people used to travel by ship mostly. So it didn't really, you know, spread, spread that quickly. So Nowadays, you know, you detect it in South Africa. Tomorrow, you know, it's already in Australia. But then we you know, it's very vaccines, different. Which they didn't. They didn't have vaccines. I mean, those kids, yeah, exactly. So things have changed, but I think there's a lot of hope and optimism. I think it's just that people were hoping that it's already going to happen. And then this year didn't Again. start. I mean, this is not going to start really well. At least in America, we're expecting a lot of cases in January. It's uh, unfortunate. And, um, you know, but people, uh, you know, from what you see, people are doing things and they have been told that you, if you're vaccinated and boosted in the United States, you can do things safely. If you have planned to see your family, if you have planned to travel, if you have planned to go to a restaurant, you can do it. You know, it's not that you can't do it, but you need to know that you need to keep yourself safe. So the narrative is kind of changing now. You know, if you get the vaccine, if you're, you know, if you have boosted, you can still live your life. Yes, you have to be a little cautious. You know, nobody's telling you to sit at home and close the door and never come out. I don't think that narrative is like going to happen or being sold at all. But so, you know, but that's only going to slowly uptick and it's only going to take some time when millions will, you know, start traveling again, just like the way it used to be, or millions will start going to restaurants again, that the way it used to be. So. You're right. Uh, the travel is opening up. More and more people want to go to the places which are open, airy, so that the risk is less. That's outdoor, it's outdoor, yeah. Outdoor. Actually, I forgot, I forgot to mention, resorts during the pandemic have done the best job. Very good. Like they, we have a lot of resorts around, say, in Mexico or in you know countries like Dominican Republic, and they were doing so well because people didn't want to go to city hotels. They wanted to just go to a beach town and sit there yeah. and and they were doing and all the hotels that were opening the resorts they were doing really well yes. and travel and the destinations like resort destinations they were doing really well for airlines yes. so there is another change so we're going back to nature and more of less of concrete more of greens yes more of healthy uh, food you have so the uh, turmeric latte which we call our haldi dood so uh, all those things, they are opening up good meals. We are going back to nature. What we drifted away from, nature has its own way of making us realize that you need to come back to that. So naturally, mm -hmm. as you said, the things will be modified for change, for better, modified for better. The change would be for better. And gradually mm -hmm. as we occur, get, and it has at least uh, in my country, I can say that it has helped a lot for the time being at least, that people have mm -hmm. started those, even the roadside dhabas and vendors have started looking for cleanliness and hygiene a lot. That's great. A lot. But still, we will have people eating uh, golgappas or pani batashas or something like that, which will stay, which gives us our immunity to begin with. But still, this pandemic... No, I, can, yeah, can, I, can I interrupt you? So I was, it's funny, it's a very good point. I was in Delhi and I was trying to get a dosa and I remember going in there, it was a kiosk in one of the major malls. And I went and I wanted to get that. So I got it. And the guy was both were wearing masks. And he pointed to me to go and sit and not stand there. So he will call my name so I can come and pick it up. And I was wearing a mask too, because in that place, they kept looking at you and they kept telling you to have a mask on. But, you know, he kept telling this to everybody that don't stand around here and only come to get it so that there's no crowding so you know and he was just one of the workers in that that you know that shop but i was very impressed that he was following that protocol so and i've seen that yes people are wearing gloves and they're having you know i think little things go a long way you know you don't have to really push people to do you know or teach them everything i think you give them the basics you tell them what is important and how to keep safe they will do it they are doing it they are doing it mm -hmm. and as you said yes there were certain places which were not meant to be there but they started just for the fun of it because people were doing it ah, shut down we have good mm -hmm. things also unfortunately that's yes but then but uh, overall we yeah. have few uh, good restaurants which are still surviving the smaller ones are taking care of the hygiene the mm -hmm. opening up 
the people uh, to tell you on a very uh, lighter note in delhi i know of ladies who are now meeting for their kitties in parks oh interesting yes. so they are doing it so they haven't uh, there was an elderly lady there was some it's become more like a picnic now in the park and not at home i, I was uh, like you know I, because i see it from a psychological perspective so there was yeah. no elderly ladies they got vaccinated and they said now we want to meet so they said okay fine we'll meet in the nearby park so that there was a bench laid and everything and you still have the fear less so see as you said people we are not going to go away with meeting people or interacting with them we are just going to find ways to come out of it conquer our fear and also vaccines and medicine helping us and yeah. hygiene keeping us so that was a wonderful wonderful session dr merutra i'm so happy and glad that you could take some time out and give us this global perspective and also the encourage our students and everywhere because uh, people are watching from all over the world to us so and everyone that how the opportunities has also come up and how we have to hope and go on with the life in a better way i think life has Absolutely. much much better to offer to us in coming years yes yes thank that's you done. for having me and i want to wish to i thank everybody that's made this session possible including the people that join in on facebook live and you know my big shout out to all the viewers because that's important too so okay so as i finish this i wish a very happy healthy prosperous new year to you to all the participants and the audience made the 2020 rock <laughs> makes everything Absolutely. possible and be yeah. very happy cheerful and hopeful and resilient thank you thanks thank a lot you, thank, thank you take care thank you. bye